Folks, uh, I'd like to introduce to you a friend of ours. He's a wonderful, wonderful man. Uh, he's the founder and president of World History Institute, Institute and uh, that he established in 1976. Uh, he's a best-selling author. He conducts seminars and tours all over the country and all over the world. And he was chosen to write a historical introduction to the 2007 print of uh, this 1599 Geneva Bible. An incredible patriot, an incredible man. Hmm? Yeah, an incredible man. And he just wrote a book called The American Covenant. Yeah, uh, some of you have it, yeah, yeah. And, um, and he also did this other little number, what, what is it? Oh, oh yeah, he, he, he made a little thing called Monumental with Kirk Cameron. Uh, yeah, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce you to our good friend, Dr. Marshall Foster. The pilgrims wouldn't even call this a dribble. Can you imagine? The pilgrims coming across the ocean and say, well, nobody would show up. You know, there was a dribble today. We, we won't go to church. Hey, isn't it fun to be together? I can't believe I've never seen so many clean-shaven, maskless people in all my life. It's just uh, nice to see you all. It's, we're, we're growing beards instead, you know. It's, as Kirk said, uh, you know, what is it, beard, beard November? Well, we're moving Beard November. We are going to do that. But what a joy. What a joy to be with you. It's been about 35, 40 years ago I came here for the first time, met Paul Jaley. So many of those that have gone before for the event that we have today have, have gone to their reward. Verna Hall and Rosalie Slater, two ladies who wrote the Red Books, we call it, are ladies that 70 years ago began to research America's Christian history and it had been totally forgotten. For over 100 years, the people of America had been taught a, a neo-Marxist view of history that had, had, had swept into the public schools beginning in the 19th century and on into the early 20th century with a man named John Dewey and the founder of progressive public education. And from then through men like Charles Beard and his wife who wrote many volumes, they rewrote American history and they took this story out. They took the story out of the greatest nation the world has ever known built upon the word of God and the first republic since the time of ancient Israel that has been built upon these principles. This is the story the American people do not know today. And until we know that story, how can we possibly restore what we don't know how to restore? And that we don't know we even had. If we forget who we are, as Ronald Reagan said, then we will lose the freedom that we enjoy. And we'll grow up or we'll send our, how do you say it? We'll spend our sunset years telling our grandchildren what it was like to live in America when it was free. That's how serious the moment that we live in today is. How many of you know how serious this moment is? This is a time to restore and renew our covenants with God. It's a time to restore and renew our understanding of our relationship with Him and one another and with our nation. And as we do, the gates of hell shall not prevail against my church. I, as my wife says, I always give this the summary of my sermon at the beginning. She said, Marshall, you might as well sit down. You've already said it. But that's, what can I say? Anyway, it is such a joy to be with you. And, and it's been a joy to be in this movement with men, like, men and women, Paul Jaley and the team that is right here in Plymouth that have been fighting this battle for 20, 30, 50 years and longer that we would restore this pilgrim heritage to the nation. I want to go back with you, since I have a few minutes before Kirk comes, I want to go back with you and review this history, but I want to review it back before the time the pilgrims arrived. I want to take us back to at least Moses and real briefly give you a quick summary of how the covenants have marched through history. Because what you're seeing here is almost exactly 3,000 years from the time that Moses was about to relieve the children of Israel. And he was going to die on a mountaintop, and he was sending the people, as you read in the book of Deuteronomy, across into the promised land. He gave them the strategy that they needed to build a Christian republic. And that strategy was given in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 to 10, in what is called the Shema. 
And the Jewish people who are Orthodox today use it, Shema, and their children recite the Shema all the time. We, all of us in the body of Christ, and all of us as Americans should re re rehearse that because guess what? What you see on this monument is a, is a repeat of the Shema. It's the basic principles that are laid down there. To do what? It says we must love God and know God as parents. And then we must teach our children in the morning when they rise up and throughout the day and when they lie down at night. And then we are to live out these principles and put them on our forehead and, and, and carry them out in our, in, our, in, our, in, our, in our parlors and in our front porches. And then it says out to the gates which is the city gates. So we start in the home. We start in our hearts. And from our hearts out to hospitality to our neighbors, from there out to the city gates where we tell the government the way it ought to be run. <laughs> but you can't go out and tell anybody how it ought to be done if you haven't been doing it at home. And if you haven't been doing it at home, then we need to be doing it there, right? starting with our own hearts and our own families and teaching our own friends, and then we become a force to be reckoned with peacefully, simply saying, let's hold on to the Constitution and the Republic for which it stands, which happens to be built upon the Hebrew Republic from over 3,000 years ago. And what I'm saying, when I say the Hebrew Republic, my people say, well, what do you mean? America's Constitution was built on the Hebrew Republic? I've never heard that. Well, the Founding Fathers all knew that. I mean, even when, when the Constitution was about to be ratified, New Hampshire was the final ninth state. And if New Hampshire didn't ratify it in 1788, it was going to go down in flames. There was going to be no Constitution. And so at the, at the convention, when they were down to the final vote, they brought in one person to preach, and his name was Samuel Langton. He was the, he was the actual uh, president of Harvard University before that, and now as the leading pastor in all of New England, they asked him to come in and preach a sermon. And the sermon was specifically, America was built upon the sacred Hebrew Republic, and we will be facing Almighty God if we do not restore and rebuild it on those principles. And guess what? They voted for the Constitution, and we ended up a free nation with the Constitution. Because he preached the principles of the Bible as the foundation for civil government. If the Bible is not the foundation, then you lose the Christian population of the country who thinks that there's no tie between civil government and civil authority and what's going on in the church. And so you have a lot of people in my generation picked up what I call rapture fever, where we kind of thought maybe we could just kind of live in our, in our own little lives out here and let the culture go to you know what, and it would be okay because, you know, the Lord's coming soon anyway, so we don't have to worry about having children. Well, that's not the way to live, if you know what I mean. The point is that, that as we began to understand now and look back on the Constitution the way it was, we say, wait a minute. God gave us these principles and nothing has changed. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If the principles given to the Hebrew Republic, which would allow sinful men to live in a society where there could be justice and freedom with a localized, not centralized, system of government where you elect your judges and where you, where you have a Senate and a House and you have the, the more the, the people that have wisdom and older around a small group and then the larger group is a House of Representatives representing all the people and then, and then you develop it into local tribes and you don't have a national sitting army that controls everyone and, and the executive only rises up in a time of war. You begin to see that all the ties as our founding fathers beginning with the pilgrims for 150 years in every township in Massachusetts and in Connecticut and down through into Virginia when they were building their local constitutions, they built it upon these principles of the Hebrew Republic. They built it on the principles of the Ten Commandments and our, our own presidents throughout the years, even into the 20th century, have said the foundation of America is not Karl Marx, as Truman said and others, it is the Ten Commandments. The Bible is the foundation for liberty and justice and freedom. Five of the Ten Commandments deal with what? Private property, right? And, and you can go on and on with the principles of the commandments, which are fundamental to the very principles that built America's society that respects the individual and protects the individual and the family, not the corporate conglomerate at the top, which can mean anything you want it to mean. 
Each individual is important to God as any other individual, and we must respect individual rights. These principles were all biblical principles, and they were worked into our founding father's generation so that by the time you get to the Constitutional Convention and to the winning of the American Revolution, John Adams was asked, what revolution? The American Revolution? Oh, he said that revolution took place in the hearts of the people during the Great Awakening before the revolution ever took place. You see, what was needed for America to win a war against the greatest army and navy the world had known to that point was that they first had to have their hearts right with God, and they had fallen away from God in the 1720s and 30s, and they took a great awakening before America was restored in their hearts and minds to have Christ as their leader, as, as Samuel Adams, the leader of the Sons of Liberty, right up here as we were studying him with my grandchildren, who are all seated here. They're coming in from Tennessee. We, had to, we have to get these Tennesseans trained in what it is. It all started in New England, right? <laughs> Right. Right. So, anyway, you know, Samuel Adams, well, I forget what Samuel Adams said. I taught my grandkids and I've forgotten Samuel. But, uh, no, he, he is the great example. We'll get to him in a minute because he uses the strategy of the forefathers' monument. Sa oh, Samuel Adams was saved in the Great Awakening under George Whitfield at Harvard in the 1730s. He goes on to become the great patriot who is behind the scenes developing the local strategy of the campfire revival in the 1770s called the Committees of Correspondence. It went from town to town to town, and the American people rose up understanding these principles together as one so that they, he knew that was what was necessary before there would be any kind of conflict. And even, he didn't even want a conflict, neither did any of the founders. They had to follow Matthew 18 and the principles of scripture and go through 10 years of remonstrances, 10 years of pleading with the king, 10 years of going to their local magistrates before they would even consider it. And even after that, it wasn't until they were attacked and they were, they were boarded in their homes and they were being killed at Lexington and conquered. Only as a last resort did they ever go to the place where they had to fight. But when they fight, oh, did they fight. And they won their freedom. But it's a matter of character, isn't it? It's character and self-government and understanding what the scriptures say and what the scriptures teach as to strategy. I've been in this battle a long time. Uh, I've been the president of the World History Institute now for uh, <coughs> 46 years. A uh, long time, and we've been teaching this since the days of Verna Hall and Rosalie Slater and the days of, of John Talcott. John Talcott is one of the great heroes of Plymouth who actually paid for the Bradford statue. He is, uh, you know, and the Plymouth Rock Foundation came out of his life and ministry. And one of the great men of our time who lived into his hundreds. This, this great hero uh, was a friend of mine, and what a man. And these are the kinds of people who have laid their lives down in this last generation that people like Kirk and I and others could then rise up and simply pass the message on. You are the message. You are the people who carry the covenant. This is not a top down. This is not a who's got the organization. This is in the heart of every American Christian. There should be an understanding that we are in covenant with God and that God wants to disciple the nations. He said so in the Great Commission, didn't he? In Matthew 28, we're to go and disciple the nations. And Matthew Henry said, to disciple the nations means to make all nations Christian nations. That's our goal. Our goal is not to just, you know, take a, a four spiritual outbook and drop it into China by a billion and in, a, in a balloon and our job is done. No, we want to disciple the nations that the people of China would be free so that they could study their Bibles and understand and live in a biblically based constitutional republic. I want to see culture as best we can in a sinful world reflect the character and nature of a liberating God. And if we want that, then we can have it if we will follow God's principles. Because guess what? Covenant keepers win and covenant breakers lose. You just have to stay around long enough to see the end of the story. <laughs> now, that's what's so important about going back and remembering. The scripture says the beginning of... How many think we need a revival in America? How many, how many of you know the first thing that has to happen before revival? Many would say prayer. Well, boy, you're right. Exactly. If there's no prayer, and there are some prayer warriors out here that have been praying for 50 years, right? 
and your prayers are, are being answered, and they, they do not go void for sure. But I want to say that as Jesus put it, he gave us three specific principles that we need to follow. He said to the church at Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2, he said, these are the three things you need to do, Ephesus. You have forgotten your first love. You've forgotten me. And how do we solve that? He said, remember from whence you have fallen. Repent and do the deeds you did at first. Do you know why I believe we as Americans have not corporately repented of our sin of abortion, our sin of letting our nation go down and the republic fall apart? It's because we don't remember that God gave us this through the blood of the martyrs and through the sweat and tears and prayers of millions of saints over a period of 3,000 years so we could come to America and express it to the world. We don't know that story. Once we know it, doesn't that make you feel a little bit like... Oh, God, I need your forgiveness for letting go of the greatest heritage the world has ever known. It's not that America is perfect. We're not perfect at all. But our God is great, and he is good, and he is gracious. And he gave us the, not only the principles and the way and the strategy, but he gave us the power of the Holy Spirit to transform our lives so that by his grace we can walk with him and change as we grow. That is the beauty of revival and awakening when it is a full-on awakening. First thing we do in awakening is remember. That's what we're doing tonight. We're remembering how far we've fallen. And there's no better way to remember than to go back to the Gilgal stones. I got a little sidetracked there. I started out talking about Moses. I want to come back to him for a minute now. You notice how I just break into four or five different sermons. Well, that's kind of... That's because I'm a frustrated preacher who wants to do several sermons at once since I only get this kind of audience every now and then. <laughs> no, I'm just... But, but seriously, isn't it exciting to be able to go back and have a remembrance that is in, that's right here in the largest granite monument in America? Duh. You think maybe God had that planned, right? And it's sitting here right in front of us, and the strategy is the strategy of God, the same one that God gave to Moses. And it is that strategy of, of doing exactly what we see happening here with the transformation of art, knowing God, loving God, you know, seeing your life transformed by the law of God, living it out into the community and the law. And then, guess what? Then you'll have houses you didn't build, and I'll give you lands you've never seen. And those are the blessings that come according to the covenant. For Deuteronomy chapter 6 and 7 says... For those who love me and keep covenant with me, I shall bless them to a thousand generations. So when we're talking about covenant, we're not talking about some small thing. We're talking about the blessings of Abraham coming down to your children's children to a thousand generations. Wow, I don't know about you, but I get kind of exciting about that. I could, I could die for something like that. Because my children's children will go on long after me and they'll live in liberty because... They can look back and say, well, granddad, at least you followed the pilgrims. Remember what was said by our dear Paul Jaley today when he was quoting John Robinson? I love that statement when, when Bradford says in his manuscript, this is William Bradford's manuscript, the greatest political document ever written in the history of mankind, rediscovered in the 1880s after being lost to the, probably to the, uh, to the English during the American Revolution. The actual handwritten version was rediscovered. And it became a treasure of Massachusetts. It's now, you can see it in the, uh, with the Kennedy Library, I think, where they have it now. But that, this is a treasure. And it's in here that we read uh, the great principles laid out by William Bradford that the pilgrims lived by. And, and some of his great quotes that just uh, exemplify the things that we're teaching today about a constitutional republic and doing it God's way from the grassroots, from the family up. When you look at William Bradford as he was about ready to come across the ocean with his pilgrim fathers, he explained, other than the fact that they thought they were going to get filleted by the population when they got here, and they thought most of them would die before they got here, and the fact that even though they did, they felt like, well, they were in a worthy venture, and even if they did, they were doing it for God, and so they're willing to venture out. They gave the reasons they came, and they said, we came for four reasons. And Bradford says, first, they saw by experience that the hardships of the country were such that comparatively few others would join them, and fewer still would bite it out and remain with them. 
I don't know if I'd bite it out either if I saw friends having their ears cut off and having others being burned at the stake and then inviting them to church, saying, why don't you come join our church, you know? It's kind of a tough sell. And they were always saying, do you have a youth group? Uh, no, probably not, but we do. you can be burned for it. It's kind of exciting. But they, but they wanted to be in a place that was free so that they could bring their friends to church. Is it, is it, they wanted to be able to lead them to Christ and to, and to have that as a, as a privilege. The second reason, he said that's really the reason they came. He wanted a place of freedom to preach the gospel. Secondly, they said that they, their enemies were threatening to kill them. They were losing their sanctuary in Holland. The Spanish were going to come in, and the first people to die were going to be these separatists. And they were told that. That was the end of you. And it was, it was one year away from the end of the treaty, and they were coming after them. And so they said, maybe a good idea to get out of town. They didn't have an army or a navy. They just had about 300 folks. And so they decided maybe, well, the, the better part of valor is let's go to where? I think they were talking about going to South America for a while, and I'm so glad they didn't. I don't like those bugs down there. That's not for me, but they decided to go to the New York, and of course they ended up not in New York, but here, and I'm so glad they did because they were out of the King's Charter, and they wrote something called the Mayflower Compact, which became the greatest constitutional, biblically-based form of government the world has ever known and was copied and ended up with the United States Constitution. Kind of a miracle. So they came because they wanted to get away from their enemies and have freedom. Thirdly, they came to protect their children. They were losing their children to a very secular Dutch society, and many of them were joining the Dutch Navy and really losing their faith in some terrible times and some licentiousness there. And so they said, we want to be able to raise our children in the faith and not have some uh, down, top-down government bureaucracy telling our kids what is the truth about whatever. Is this sounding strangely familiar yeah. to what's going on today? Well, it should, because it's exactly what's going on today. And what happens in every society in the midst of almost tyranny, the tyrants use the same strategy. They squeeze the people from the top, from the bottom, and they especially want to get their kids. As Adolf Hitler said, I don't care what you believe because I own your children. So they didn't want their children owned. They wanted to be able to raise them in the Bible. And the fourth reason that William Bradford said they came was last not the, but not least, they cherished a great hope and inward zeal of laying good foundations, or at least of making some way towards it for the propagation and advancement of the gospel of the kingdom of Christ to the remotest parts of the world, even though they should be but stepping stones to others for the performance of so great a work. This to me is one of the greatest statements that I've ever heard a man say. A man who is about to die in the wilderness, knows he's about to die, leaves his son behind because he knows he's probably going to be dead. He only brings his wife. And of course, Dorothy is the first one to die, falling off the back of the Mayflower on the first day they come. He loses his wife, and yet he comes anyway. But they came to what? Propagate the gospel of Christ so that they could be but stepping stones. And as I've been giving seminars for 40 years, what I like to tell the people, look at that, there's some hope. Look at the birds. They, they know how to fly and found, maybe we can agree together and fly together. That would be nice. <laughs> stepping stones are very important because guess what? These, were, these meant that they were the stepping stones. That means they came over here. There was probably two feet of snow on the ground. They land in a, in a, in a very, it's, a, it's an ice age. It's colder than it is now, much colder. And in the midst of that ice age, they laid their lives down in the wilderness and blew bubbles in the mud so their children could walk on their back to the greatest constitutional republic the world has ever known. If that's not faith, I don't know what it is. That's, that's what changes the course of history. It's not armies. It's not the power and force of your macho. It is men and women willing to die for greater things, especially for their children, their children's children, and for their God and for his principles. Once those principles are ingrained, once we, we trust him daily and repent of our sins daily and walk with him daily, then it becomes a part of us. And no one can take that away from us. And we will stand whether we live or whether we die. And we'll stand with Patrick Henry. I do not know what other course men may take. But as for me, give me liberty or give me death. But remember, when Patrick Henry said that in 1775, in April, to the Virginia legislature, 
He said that and also prefaced it by saying, three millions of people armed in the holy cause of liberty are invincible against any force that can come against us. And besides, sir, a just God rules in the affairs of men. You see, the first thing that has to happen is that we've got to have our hearts and our minds transformed so that we have the holy cause of liberty in our heart. That is what the covenant is all about. The covenant is knowing that God is a covenanting, loving God who has a plan. And that plan has been the same from the beginning. Okay, let me just summarize because I, uh, I'm going into Sermon 3. <laughs> As I'm summarizing, I want, you to, I want you to close with this. I want you to see, number one, Moses planned it. And Moses executed it. He didn't really execute it because it, he, he left them. And he died up on the mountain. He sent him in with the plan. There was a guy named Joshua. And you read about this in Joshua chapter 4. And when they were walking in, did they just walk into the land or what happened? Oh, there was a miracle. And the miracle was that the river stopped. And the river Jerson probably sat 300, 300 feet in the air. And it was dry as a bone. And over goes the Ark of the Covenant. And under that, there goes 3, 4 million people walk into the promised land and begin to fight and take it back, Right? But that's not the real story. The real story is there was 12 people that were assigned to pick up the stones at the bottom of the raw land that used to be the River Jordan. And they were told to go to the top of Mount Gilgal and put those stones up as a monument. As a monument so that when your children ask, why are these stones here? You can tell them that it is here that God did a miracle. And here he opened the Jordan River. And here he made a way for our people. Until we remember the landmarks of our fathers, until we remember the Gilgal stones, we won't have the faith and the courage to stand for him. This isn't a fleshly thing. This isn't a political thing. And Ronald Reagan said it so well. And he says a lot of things well. Ronald, do we not love Ronald? But Ronald said, he said, he said, this is not a battle of left or right. He said, it's a battle of up or down. Either, either up to the maximum amount of liberty under law and freedom or down to the ant heap of totalitarianism. There is no, there is no option of just having a middle of the road. You're going to go one way or the other. Does that make sense? Yeah. So we don't want to call, this is not a political movement. What we're talking about today is a movement to simply get back to the covenants with God. And you know what? The difference between the covenants or the mandates of God is that they're voluntary. Even the children of Israel had the privilege of coming up, even at Mount Sinai, and giving a claim, or, 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 or saying, yes, we will, to the covenants of God. And throughout the history of Israel, they would do that. They would bring in the people, and they would all agree together to the covenant. God is a loving God who wants to covenant with us in the discipling of the nations. That's the cultural commission. That's the great commission tied together and he does it he says lovingly and kindly through your self-sacrifice the army of compassion which is the body of christ can reach out to a, a dying world and give them hope that they too can be free that is the beauty of the gospel that is the beauty of our commission and if we will follow him and go back to the covenants of our fathers we will see that god is the same yesterday and today forever it's moses said it Jesus amplified it and gave us the Holy Spirit to fulfill it. He said in the Great Commission, go and disciple the nations, making the nations Christian nations. That's what, as Matthew Henry said. And as we go about doing that, we do it by what? Preaching the gospel and discipling individuals and families and churches and our children. And then, he, then it's carried out by men like Patrick of Ireland. How could Patrick of Ireland take the most brutal naked, weird people the world ever known called the Irish in the, fourth, in the fourth century and march in there and within 35 years make them the first Christian nation in the world. How did he do it? He took the, mo the lever of Moses, that's all he had, was a scroll. He didn't even have a completed Bible. And he passed it out to these pagan Druid priests and he had them change their laws. No, we're not going to throw mother into a hole and bury her. Oh, no, we're not going to sacrifice our children to get a better crop. We think we have a better way than that. And the Irish were overwhelmed with joy that they didn't have to sacrifice their children. You mean we don't have to sacrifice our children? And Patrick says in his confession, he says, no, 
God himself has sacrificed his own son for you. You do not have to sacrifice your children ever again. You see, the plan of God has always been for freedom and liberty for all people. And that, that is accomplished through walking back and seeing his loving covenants and restoring them for yourself first and then for your family and then to your local community and from there to your nation. It can happen anywhere. Patrick saw it. Alfred the Great comes along, and he's the last king of England. Everybody else is dead and, or has run for Rome. They've all been cut up and flayed by the Vikings. The Vikings have taken all of England, okay? What do you do when you've lost your company? Now he even lost his castle. He had his wife and 20 people, and he was living in a swamp. What do you do then? Well, you pray. You get right with God, right? And so Alfred the Great is praying, and, of course, he's got the vision. He's, he's probably heard about the... No, he didn't hear about this. That was a few hundred years later. But he had the strategy of Moses, the same thing. He said, if I'll do it God's way, if I will teach my people to read the scriptures, if I'll take the Ten Commandments and put it in front of my common law, if I will inspire them to stand against evil, even at the grassroots, then guess what? Maybe England could be saved. And he came out of those woods with a group of peasants, and they defeated in, in, in 878 A.D. a huge Viking army under Guthrum. And he went to Guthrum, and he surrounded his leaders, and he took his 30 leaders. And, of course, what you do with your leaders when you, they've been raping your land for all these years is you cut their head off, right? No. Alfred offered him forgiveness. And he said, you train your 30 leaders and you yourself repent of your sins, come to God, and guess what? I'll split England with you and we will end this feud and we will e and bring about a Christian England. And guess what? Guthrum, the mighty pagan warrior, repented of his sins, was trained for over two weeks, three weeks, went back, was given part, the southern part of England, and defended Alfred for the next 10 years before he died, changed his name to Son of Alfred, and incredibly, England became a Christian nation instead of worshiping Odin. It was all done following the principles of training from the grassroots and loving families. Who do you think started the idea of the county? Who is the person who said that when there's, when there's uh, debauchery at the local level, it destroys the national? It has to all start at the local. And we had to have training in the English language, not only in Latin, in the Bible. That was all Alfred. You see, he had the strategy. If you go through there all the way through to the, 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 uh, the Reformation, you see it develop in Scotland. They bring in the Geneva Bible through John Knox. And within 14 years, the pagan Scots, of which I consider myself one, even though I'm only half there with the English, I found out, but... Enough so that I can say as a Scot, I'm so glad that I'm not worshiping the pagan gods they did in the 15th century. And guess what? John Knox just walked in and had nothing but a Geneva Bible, the Bible the pilgrims had. And he walked into Scotland within 15 years before his death. He saw Scotland turn its back on tyranny, bring about constitutional government as a base. And those Scots, when they were persecuted by the English, came over to America in the 17th and 18th century. And they were 80% of George Washington's officers' corps and the bulk of his army that defeated the British in the American Revolution. Because they understood the covenants. As the Scots said, the covenants, the covenants shall yet be Scotland's revival. They understood that it was not the power of the flesh. It was not the power of the sword. It's the power of the covenants. Walk with God and God will walk with you and with your family and with your nation. Isn't that exciting news? Anyway, I'm going to leave you now, but I wanted to say this. I pray that you will join with us as we go through this year and continue to have your own revival. New video just out. Kirk leading the way. I have to get to be with him. And then Stay with us as we move forward. The campfire is just beginning. It needs to go back to your homes and mine. Let's go back, and as we go, repent and walk with him. And we're going to see him do great and mighty things, greater than we can ask or think, remembering that the gates of hell shall not prevail against my church. Thank you very much.